So we'll start straight away with our first speaker, is Roger Knight from the, uh, from the Spey. And uh, Roger is going to talk to us about the experience they've had on the Spey in relation to looking in some detail at the cost-benefit analysis of a major stocking programme. And we heard some bits and pieces about the Spey earlier in the conference. So we look forward to what Roger has to say. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Roger Knight. I'm the director of the Spey Board and the Spey Foundation. Uh, and I feel I'm in something of, mo of a minority, uh, particularly in present company, because I'm a river manager, director of one of the rivers, one of the big four salmon rivers here in Scotland, but I'm not a scientist. Uh, I come from a very different background. And uh, Mark Coulson presented this morning much of the science behind what I'm going to talk about. Some of the slides that he showed, I'm going to be showing elements of those during this presentation, but I'm really not looking at the detail of the science. I'm looking at the application of that, because whilst I'm interested in science, I'm even more interested in what it can do for us. And what I've been asked to talk about this afternoon is the costs and benefits of stocking, to give you some idea as to how much it has cost us, what we've got from it, and in some cases, what we haven't, managing expectations, and making the best use of resources. Just in summary, we've operated two hatcheries on the Spey in the past, between 2004-2010, uh, producing up to 2.2 million fry and eyed over at its peak. We're now down to one hatchery, producing approximately 230,000. I'll be explaining more about that as we go through. From the genetic analysis of rod caught fish and the broodstock samples, this was the work that Mark Coulson and Eric have been doing, the indications are that our hatcheries may have contributed up to about 150 fish per year to a rod catch of between 8 and 10,000. Now hatcheries can be a very effective fishery management tool in the right circumstances, but they're not the only tool in the box. And from our experience, when operated for enhancement purposes, they seem to have had little impact. I'll be giving you more illustrations as to why we believe that is the case. What we need to do is raise awareness of this. Now, we're continuing to stock, but at the moment, we're stocking for mitigation purposes rather than enhancement. And what that has allowed us to do is to reallocate some of our resources to other areas of fishery management, in particular habitat in improvements. I thought I'd better start by just um, giving you an overview of the spay catchment itself. Uh, we've got a, a, a main stem river of 107 miles, approximately 560 miles of main tributaries, and we are also responsible for 20 miles of coastline with a remit that extends three nautical miles out to sea. A catchment overall of 3,008 square kilometres, or just under 1,900 miles which I used to think was a big patch of real estate until I listened to Stephen Gephardt yesterday talk about the Connecticut uh, catchment at 29,000 square kilometres, I think. Anyway, uh, that's an overview of the catchment. Now, in terms of our hatcheries, we have in the past operated two hatcheries, our own at Sandbank, which is the one pictured here in Glenlivet, uh, and the other at Tolkien Estate. Tolkien was owned is owned and was operated at the estate's expense, but under a management agreement with the Spey Board. We're currently producing 200, about 230,000 fed fry each year, but as I said in the summary, it has been up to 2.2 million, which sounds like a lot, but actually in the scale of the catchment overall, it is still a minor intervention. That capacity has been reduced partly as a result of the FASMOP genetics project, but also as we have opened up areas. We had uh, a project running between 2004 and 2008, sponsored by the EU CAS Life Fund, which opened up areas of our uh, catchment to natural spawning, and thereby areas that we had stocked in the past, we no longer needed to stock thereafter. Now, our hatchery has a full-time hatchery manager, and a part-time, formerly when we were operating uh, at 2.2 million, a part-time assistant. He spent three days a week there. 
It's a commitment that takes 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days of the year. And we're very fortunate to have a hatchery manager for whom this is his life. It is his passion. He lives on site. And if he needs to be up at three o'clock in the morning to clear the intake, he will do so. Now, it has cost us at the peak of its production in the region of £120,000 per year to operate. People are often surprised by that and they say, and that's just for one hatchery, that's just for Sandbank here. Tolkien's was probably in the region of 40 to 50,000 per year, but that, was, that expense was borne by the estate. People have been surprised at that figure because they say, oh, we could operate a hatchery for far less than that. If you look at just the running costs, the power and light and the fish food and the occasional maintenance, it's probably about 5,000 pounds a year. But when you add into that equation the expenses of a full-time hatchery manager and his vehicle, the part-time assistant, the involvement of our bailiffs in the broodstock capture, the equipment that they need for that capture, some of which has to be serviced every year because of health and safety. The vehicle costs, this has partly driven our vehicle policy as well. When you add all of that into the equation, that is where we get this figure of about £120,000. Now, that was at its peak. One of the points I'd like to make is that when you reduce your hatchery production, you do not get a proportional reduction in costs. If you halve production, you don't halve the costs because you've still got the hatchery manager. You've still got all the equipment that you need for the broodstock capture. At the moment, with running at uh, a production of 230,000, it's probably costing us in the region of 55 to 60,000 pounds per year to operate, just to give you some idea of the costs. Now, there's also another significant factor on the, uh, that we need to consider, and that is a broodstock capture license. Here in Scotland, if you are taking broodstock for, from the river out with the salmon netting season, i.e. after the 26th of August, you need to be licensed for it by the Scottish Government. So we have to submit a license application, which is also considered by Scottish Natural Heritage and Marine Scotland Science. And for rivers that are special areas of conservation, and the Spey is one of them, that needs to be covered by an appropriate assessment as well. Why did we start this programme? Well, back in 2004, we put in our annual report, the aim of the stock enhancement policy is to boost the natural smolt output from the spay catchment and hence adult returns. In turn, extra fish may be caught in the rod fishery. And we actually quoted that we thought we might get an additional 842 fish to the rods. I wish. This followed an apparent increase in marine mortality and impact upon the number of fish returning to the catchment. Now, until a few years ago, uh, really when it, it was, about, I think about 2007, when Eric Verspoor came to talk to us and talk to us about the, the potential capabilities of genetic analysis, we had, I had boldly stood up and said that we were confident that our hatcheries were not causing any harm. Even at its peak, we were taking less than 1% of the fish from the catchment to use as broodstock. We were carefully segregating the fish from different tributaries in different parts of the hatchery. We were carefully looking after the, uh, the fed fry and planting those fed fry back out into the same areas of the catchment from which their parents had come. We were confident at that time that we were not doing any harm. It's only recently, particularly with the advent of genetic analysis and the application of that to direct fisheries management, that we've been able to discover whether we're actually doing any good rather than simply not doing any harm. So I'll outline briefly the three aims that we had, and this was a FASMOP uh, focusing Atlantic salmon management on populations. Um, I know that you scientists are very keen on acronyms, and that was the one that we produced for this one. Uh, for the SPAY, this was a Scotland-wide project, but for us we had three principal aims. First aim was to assign fish caught in uh, mixed stock fisheries to their river of origin. Secondary aim, to determine whether our stock consists of one single population or whether it is broken down into subpopulations so as to better inform our fishery management. And a third aim was to identify whether the fish caught in the rod fishery had originated from our hatcheries. 
using these genetics of, of maternity and paternity. Now, that was very much a, a third aim. I think in terms of the, the results from it, uh, it's, it's become much more prominent. It, it would almost appear as though it's the first aim, but at the time it was the, um, the, the third aim. Now, Mark talked in detail about the science behind this, but we used a suite of 17 microsatellites at the time, um, 14 of which had been used in a similar project in Ireland. So we were confident that it would be applicable to, uh, the, to the salmon in Scotland. And if I say anything out of place, Mark, Eric, please correct me. Now, this, these 14, uh, 17 microsatellites were particularly good at identifying maternity and paternity, and thereby very useful for the hatchery contributions to the rod fishery. For some rivers in Scotland, it was also very useful for identifying whether their stock was broken down into subpopulations. But due to the size and the complexity of the spay catchment and the subtleties within the genetics of our stock, they weren't suitable to identify certainly our second aim. There was an insufficient resolution from the microsatellites to give a clear picture of the subpopulation structuring. The analysis I've drawn from this, or the analogy rather, I've drawn from this, because I'm just a simple person, I'm not like you clever scientists, is rather like digital photography. The microsatellites were a bit like taking a, a photograph with uh, a mobile phone. They gave you a picture and they gave you a fair amount of resolution. But they did, there wasn't enough of a picture there to determine the answers that we sought to many of our questions. What happened then was the project went on to collaborate with Cygene in Norway to develop the analysis using single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. And this was rather akin to putting down the mobile phone and picking up a 15 megapixel professional camera, taking the same picture, but which, really, which provided far greater resolution, far more depth of vision, and enabled us to take our research on much further. Now, in terms of the assignment to the f of fish to the river of origin, Scotland-wide, it allowed us to assign those fish with an up to an 85% uh, confidence rate. It was slightly lower for the spay. I think it was 65% for us. But it has taken us considerably along the way of identifying fish caught in mixed stock fisheries and showing the, which river they were destined for. I'll briefly mention the substocks because I know this, I don't want to stray onto this. This was uh, this presentation is about stocking. But what it showed, what the SNPs showed so far, was that our stock in some areas can show distinct populations, particularly in the outlying reaches of the Truim and the Alt Loin, which is a tributary of the Arn. They're rather on the peripheries of the catchment. But even with the SNP analysis, as you come in towards the center of our catchment, the genetic differences become far more subtle and even too subtle for the SNPs at this stage to differentiate. Anyway, that is an aside. Back to the stocking issue. What we did was we encouraged our gillies to collate samples from uh, their rod caught fish. And the reason I've put up this slide, and I do appreciate it may be difficult to make out the detail, but the reason I've put this up is because we were accused of taking samples from only a small selection of beets along the river. We hadn't, we'd taken them from a complete cross section. The Bray water here is about five to eight miles from the mouth of the River Spey. Uh, Kinherdy uh, down near Aviemore is approximately 50 miles from the mouth of the Spey. So we had taken a cross section of rod caught samples from across the rod fishery. As Mark explained this morning, what we did was we took the rod caught samples from 2008 and 2009, 558 of them. And we cross-referenced those back to the samples we'd taken from our brood stock in 2004 and 2005. Every fish that went through the hatchery had a sample taken, and we were actually credited with the foresight that we'd had. It's nice to be told that we got something right. But apparently we had a lot of foresight then, and having taken those samples, we were able to cross-reference this rod catch back to the adults in the hatchery. Because if any of these had emanated from the hatchery, that's where their parents would have come from. As Mark said this morning, uh, we've had 4,000 samples in total analyzed. 
Now, this research was done in two phases. Um, phase one was to allocate, it was to <coughs> analyze the rod court samples from 2008 and 2009 and relate them back to the broodstock in 04 and 05. The subsequent analysis, because when we were doing this, it was in uh, 2010, the subsequent analysis took these rod court samples from 2010, 11, and 12 and related those back to the broodstock samples in 2006 and 2007. So what did it show? Well, this is one of the uh, slides that Mark put up this morning, pretty much. And from this initial analysis, what it showed was that two of the fish here had emanated from our hatchery, two out of the 558 samples analyzed. Now, Mark told us that the probability of two individuals having the same genetic profile was 3.5 by 10 to the power of 32. I said, what does that mean? He said, Roger, it means one in a gazillion. So we were confident it was right. Now, on the basis of this research, two from 558, and initially we thought that there might be three, but after closer examination, I think Mark ruled a third one out. But it was approximately half of 1% of the rod catch. To try and extrapolate that to something that people could understand, we took the average catch from 2006 to 2010, which was just over 10,000 salmon and grills. I think the average was 10,100. And on the basis of this research, at half of 1%, that showed that our hatcheries were contributing around about 50 fish to the rods. Now, that initial analysis had not been complete. It had been conducted in 2010, and at that time, the 2010 rod court samples weren't available for analysis. So the two sea winter fish that would have emanated from our 2005 stocking were absent from the analysis. And we were told that that really was not a re the, the results we'd had so far were not truly representative. We needed to go back and we needed to do more. So we did so, and we had the 2010, this is the slide I showed earlier, we analyzed the 2010, 11, and 12 rod court samples, and this time also included the brood stock samples from 2006 and 2007. What that showed was that in these later years, at times, up to 1.8% of the rod caught fish had emanated from our hatcheries. And Mark produced the detail of this this morning. The hatcheries contribution from this subsequent and the initial research was shown to be relatively consistent and low, up to 1.8%. And from a rod catch of between 8,000 and 10,000 fish in these later years, a contribution of up to about 150 fish. So the hatcheries were making some contribution to the rod fishery. But you have to bear in mind that we took broodstock out of the river in order to generate those fry to plant out. And those broodstock, had they been left in the river to spawn naturally, would also have produced fish. Would they have produced the same amount or more or less? I don't know. I'm not a scientist. The sample also of the rod caught fish was statistically significant, averaging 2.5% of the catch. Because a number of people have said to me, oh, you haven't got a statistically significant sample. But that is statistically significant, so I'm advised by many scientists. Certainly if you look at uh, political polls, uh, when they take a sample of 1,000 people from the population and ask about their voting intentions, that is deemed by Mori to be statistically significant, 1,000 from a population of 62 million. So we believe that it was significant. Now, after the initial findings came out uh, about a year ago, the popular perception was that the Spay Board would immediately close its hatcheries. Surely. It had cost the board up to £120,000 per year, and surely common sense dictated that from an economic point of view alone, the hatcheries were likely to be closed. 
However, a former chairman of the Spey Board wrote in one of our annual reports, fishery management is a mixture of sound science, politics and common sense. And I would add to that, and not in equal proportion. <laughs> Scientific opinion from the science fraternity uh, towards stocking has certainly hardened in recent years. Against this, many of the, oh, many of the uh, anglers and gillies continue to look upon hatcheries as the panacea of fishery management. Indeed, there are many anglers and gillies out there who have this perception of us fishery managers that if you've got a hatchery, you're doing it right. Well, we all know that that's not necessarily the case. A hatchery is one tool in the fishery manager's box. However, it shouldn't be the first one that we reach for. 2013 has been a challenging season for many rivers, and some of my colleagues on other rivers earlier in the season were phoning me and said, I'd say, How, how's your fishing going? I said, oh, it's not good. And already we've got calls to open a hatchery. This is the first thing that the anglers think we need. We as fishery managers need to improve our communication and raise awareness. Some of you will have heard me say this before, but I'm often accused of saying that we need to educate people. And they say, oh, you can't say that, Roger, because you're being rude to people. You've got to raise awareness. <laughs> there are some people out there who need educating. <clears throat> we need to explain when you use a hatchery and when you don't. And when I'm talking about fishery managers, I'm talking about all of us here. It's not just the river directors, the fishery managers, it's all of you scientists as well. Because the scientists provide the data and the analysis and the scientific advice that guides the decisions taken by the fishery managers. Kyle, your presentation yesterday, looking at an analysis of 62 rivers monitored over 15 years, and the impact of stocking on the rod catch. That sort of thing needs to go out into the public domain. But it needs to go out not as a peer-reviewed paper for debate. It needs to go out in a manner that people can understand it. And that is a great failing, I feel, of us as fishery managers. Because we need to take people with us in any decision that we take on our stocking policy. Because at the end of the day, fisheries rely on anglers visiting them to assist with the local economy. And I'll be coming on to that with the spay uh, towards the end. FASMOP has contributed to our decision to reduce our stocking. But there have been other factors as well. I alluded to them earlier. The opening up of tributaries to natural spawning. The removal of man-made obstacles above which we had stocked in the past and once they, those obstacles were removed and the fish were able to access them, there was no longer a need for stocking to continue. Thank you. Where has it taken us? Well, stocking is going to continue for the next five years, but this time for mitigation purposes and not for enhancement purposes. We're now producing approximately 230,000 fed fry, but from one hatchery rather than two. What this has done is enabled us to reallocate some of our resources because the bailiffs, instead of spending such a significant amount of time catching brood stock and stripping the fish and maintaining the hatchery, have now got time to spend on other areas of work such as habitat enhancement. So, for example, one of the projects we were involved in last year on the Alt Logi, which had been straightened for agricultural purposes about 200 years ago, We'd removed the rock armouring and replaced it with woody debris, soft engineering, trying to re re take the river back to a suggestion of its former self. Down on the bottom here, the Alt Moorburn, an area which was a river which was heavily silted. Uh, the banks had been poached by livestock. Gabion baskets had collapsed into it. It looked awful. And what the bailiffs have done is fence off this river and planted riparian trees along its edges 
and were starting to restore it to a river that salmon might spawn in naturally. In conclusion, we've operated two hatcheries in the past. At its peak, we were pre at our peak, we were producing 2.2 million uh, fed fry and idover each year. We've now reduced it, for all the reasons that I've explained, to 230,000 from one hatchery. From the genetic analysis that Mark and Eric have been conducting, from our rod caught fishery and broodstock samples, the indications from this research are that our hatcheries may be contributing up to 150 fish to a rod catch of between 8,000 and 10,000. I say again that hatcheries can be effective fishery management tools, but in certain circumstances. They're not the only tool in the box, and certainly from our experiences, when you use them for enhancement purposes, they seem to have had little impact. What we need to do is raise awareness of this. The spay is continuing to stock, but for mitigation rather than enhancement. And what this has enabled us to do is to reallocate resources to other significantly important areas of our work, such as habitat enhancement. Why do we bother? Well, fishing on the spay brings in approximately 15 million pounds per year to the local economy. That's not to the fishery beats, that's to hotels, bed and breakfast, restaurants, local shops. It supports 367 full-time equivalent jobs. And the river itself is a special area of conservation and needs to be treated accordingly. Our challenge is something of a balancing act to maintain the economic value of those fisheries whilst also maintaining long-term conservation obligations. Before I finish, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to respond to one comment made yesterday regarding Spay Dam, which was picked out as being... Spay Dam is a, uh, a dam 12 miles from the headwaters of the Spay. Uh, it's owned and operated uh, by a major company in Fort William, and they're licensed to divert up to 94% of the top 12 miles of the Spay out of the catchment. Now, <coughs> we have significant concerns about this, and we have used our stocking program to try, as, almost as an experiment to prove that the, there was very little natural spawning above the dam and that the smolts that emanated from it w were directly correlated to the level of stocking above the dam. So as part of the research, we decided to see whether any of the returning adults to this area were, had originated from our hatchery. And Mark alluded to this this morning. We, we set an adult fish trap at the base of the fish pass to the dam, because there is a fish pass there. We've got doubts as to how effective it is, but there is one in place. We put an adult trap in there, and we caught 25 adult fish. We then electronetted the three and a half kilometers of river from the dam downstream, and we caught another eight. So we had 33 adult fish, and I, because I'm not a scientist, thought some of those must have emanated from our hatchery. We sent the samples off to Mark for analysis, genetic analysis. Do you know how many of those fish had come from our hatchery? None. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all I have to say. I'm not sure if we have time for questions or if you'd like uh, to take those at the end. Ken, over Indeed, to you. Indeed, Roger, thank you.